Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, what a wonderful place. Hello, Dijon. And what a wonderfully diverse program these few days. I'm, I'm delighted to be here and much appreciate the invitation to, to speak to you today. I'm just going to put my timer on. Let's see. I tend to move around. Well, let me, let me try this. Uh, can you all hear me? Can you see me? <laughs> okay. Well, so Bayesian predictive synthesis or Bayesian forecasting uh, and predictive synthesis. What, what do these words mean? Um, I, I, I'd like to walk through at a very high level some recent research over the last few years uh, with examples. I limit the technicality. It's a very diverse audience. Um, I've got about 145 slides, but the talk will consume about 20 of them, and so there's lots to talk about for those of you that want to ask questions later on. Um, in a nutshell, this is about a very familiar topic, combining forecasts or pooling forecasts. Now, I'm a Bayesian statistician, so for me, forecasts are always probabilistic, density forecasts, as they're referred to in some fields. And the key today is that I want to address the context, the context, contexts in which those forecasts are being combined. So let's have a couple of example contexts. Uh, one context that some of us are interested in is making money out of forecasting. And one specific area, portfolio analysis, is a canonical example. Now, in this area, the, the driving analysis, the, the driver of the analysis, is, is making money and controlling risk. It's a decision context. It's a decision context in which the utility functions in the decision analysis depend on the models in many cases. And a model, a choice of a, a probabilistic forecasting model, coupled with a utility function, defines the decision analysis. So the decision arising in that context, that forecasting context, is specific to the model. Another context some of us are interested in, well, general contexts of statistical design, uh, optimal design, reinforcement learning, all in the same bag as uh, problems of economic, macroeconomic decision-making, policy decision-making. Central banks have various levers, interest rates, money supply, that they can tweak and twiddle to try and influence the outcome of the economy. And conditional on a set of those decision choices, the forecasting model applies. So here, the model depends on the decision. And whatever utility function is applied to optimize that decision leads to a model-specific decision. So I said model-specific two or three times to emphasize the point uh, that often we have choices. We have multiple models, sometimes very many models, sometimes just a small number. And now we're automatically in the context of being interested in, well, combining post-calibration, post-correction for biases, post-analysis to explore model dependencies, combining what those models define as their forecasts. So there'll be a bit of notation. Uh, this H is a density, probability density function. It's indexed by time. We'll look at some daily data in portfolios, some monthly data and quarterly data in economics. And J indexes models. And Y is the vector of variables that are being forecast. And my world is sequential, learning through time as you see data, looking at how the models update, how parameter estimation changes, dynamic models, uh, and then forecasting ahead for subsequent decisions. So uh, we've got a bag of models. We want to use them to forecast and, and, and base decisions on those forecasts. How do we do it? Um, everybody in this room has their favorite way of combining forecasts. Whether you just do it by making it up, 
or you write down some code, or you download some code. So I'm going to use P for my forecast distribution today, time T, for tomorrow's YT. And part of the information set that I condition on is the set of predictions, the set of forecasts from each model. I'm going to, I tend to use prediction simultaneous, uh, exchangeably with forecast. For me, it means the same thing. Okay, uh, let's take an average, just a linear combination of these forecast densities H. Just average what they say with some weights. There are lots of ways to do that. Uh, a canonical way for me is Bayesian model averaging, that there'll be a probability applied to each of the models, and that will be based on historical data and updated by Bayes' theorem as new data arises. It's the core standard method uh, uh, because probability theory tells us to do it that way. There are other ways to do it, and there's a long history, of course. I allude to some of the, the literature that's been most relevant to me over the years, uh, partly intersecting with monetary policy kinds of problems. This is a very specific way of, of combining forecasts. There are other ways to do it. Today, this is the way we're going to be do it, uh, doing it. So the specific version of a linear combination of forecast densities that we'll start with today was invented a few years ago under the name of mixture BPS, Bayesian Predictive Synthesis. And that's a pooling formula, which takes as inputs the set of model predictions, weights them with a set of probabilities and some non-negative functions that I'll call alpha. Let me tell you a little bit about what these are. So pi here is like a Bayesian model probability. On each of the models today, time t, we've had historical forecast performance that scored those models. And that builds up into current model probabilities. Standard enough. The new term in BPS, which was uh, realized about fifth, uh, 2015, but whose roots go back much further, in fact, to uh, Bank of England work in 2012, 2013, which was eventually published, uh, is what I call an outcome-dependent weight function. So each model has its own weight, but it depends on the unknown y that is being forecast. Seems a bit circular. But as long as you get out on the left-hand side a density function, you can integrate the right-hand side. That's a valid forecast density function. And the idea of the weight function is to deal with biases um, to begin, and relative areas of expertise of the models as a second, and although it's hidden in the notation, dependencies across models. So, for example, one model may be forecasting inflation as systematically over-forecasting. That needs to be corrected down, and its alpha function can, can help to do that. One model, model one, may be best at forecasting unemployment, and another model may be best at forecasting inflation. And that can go into the alpha functions. One model may be really good at forecasting uh, unemployment rates when unemployment is, is, is low and decreasing, but another model is favored when unemployment rates are high and increasing. Okay, regions of expertise in the future unknown outcome. Okay. So this is, this is old stuff. This is Bayesian predictive synthesis, and I'm going to give a simple, a, a simple example of this to begin, um, just to uh, fix ideas. Um, I will say... I'm a Bayesian statistician, and this is a fully Bayesian analysis, okay? There are classes of Bayesian analyses that regard models and the forecasts they produce as data-generating objects, and the forecast distributions are data. And this way of pooling forecast densities has a foundational theoretical basis. The final point to note is that I've got capital J models, but the sum here is indexed starting at zero. And I'll refer to that as the baseline model. And the theory requires that you extend this set of models. Suppose you have 10 models, J is 10. You add an 11th model, you index it as zero, as a baseline. And that serves a key purpose. Those 10 models may be completely hopeless at forecasting. Reality may, may look nothing like those, the predictions from those models. Okay? We choose models because we, we, we want to forecast. 
but the data arises. There's no true model, and it's certainly not one of the models we use. Okay? In econometrics, this is called model setting completeness, and this allows us a way um, of, uh, of, of, of dealing with that. Okay, so one relatively simple example we published a couple of years ago. Uh, it's an example of Bayesian predictive synthesis, and we use adaptive variable selection because it's a, a problem of linear regression. They happen to be dynamic linear regressions, time-varying parameters, where we don't know what the predictors are. It's a variable selection problem in, in, in traditional statistical terms. And it's being done every, every time period. Okay? That's why it's adaptive variable selection. And the example in that paper was a macroeconomic series of seven or eight series uh, with a time-varying vector autoregressive structure. It was monthly data, going, and we were looking at models uh, where each individual series was predicted by current or past values of any of the series going back 24 months. So there's quite a lot of models there. So you look at every model, um, and J is the number of them. So what did the BPS analysis look like in this example? Well, it was quite simple. That alpha function, the outcome-dependent weighting, was set to 1. Okay, we weren't using that flexibility in the BPS framework. But we used flexibility in specifying the way in which the model weights were updated. Bayesian model averaging, BMA, updates those weights based on scoring how well each model forecasts historically in a one step ahead setting. Each month, those probabilities are updated by how well each model forecasts this month. That's all Bayes' theorem does in dealing with model uncertainty. Okay. What we have here is an example of BPS where the weights were updated based on what they were last month, and the gamma power is some number between 0 and 1, very close to 1, 0.95. It's a discount factor that exponentially downweights historical data in the way in which these probabilities are updated in that first term. And then an exponential of a constant multiplied by S. S will be score. Synon the synonym is utility. So each model on each, each day or each month uh, is scored based on last month's performance measured by that score. As a special case, if we take gamma to be 1, tor to be 1, and the score as the log of the one step ahead predictive density for the latest observation, then that's Bayes' theorem. So Bayesian model averaging is a special case. A more general formulation, we didn't do it in this paper, is a vector of scores. You'll notice that my, my vectors are all bold, bold fonts. Uh, so we can get into multi dimensional utility functions, score functions, and we'll see that in a, in a few minutes. So why? Why do we do that? Why that particular choice? Uh, well, there's a theoretical basis. Uh, you can see that in the paper. Uh, why are we forecasting? What's, it, what's the point of, of having all of these models set up and run? Uh, what do we want to do? Do we want to forecast inflation next month? Or are we interested in where Inflation will be over the next 12 months or the next 24 months as a path of, in the economy. Uh, what are our goals in forecasting? Again, traditional BMA, I'll say this several times today, scores one step ahead forecasting. That's all it does. And if you recognize and respect the view that you know, we model for a purpose, then shouldn't we be comparing combining and using forecast densities from sets of models modulo those goals. And that's what that particular uh, um, way of updating model weights, the probabilities pies, uh, was doing. And here's a picture from the paper. This is inflation, consumption, treasury yield uh, over 1 to 24 months on each horizon, comparing uh, BPS in the red curve with BMA in the blue curve. And the vertical scale is just root mean squared error, just a simple point forecast. We could use many different metrics. 
And this shows you that if you are interested in the longer term forecasting and you weight your models with a score that respects that and reflects that interest, then you will tend to improve point forecast accuracy. At shorter horizons, BMA does fine. It's geared towards one step ahead forecasting. And unless things are moving radically uh, in, in over the next few months, then it, it will do fine. So just an example that, that goal-focused weighting of models, which is wholly Bayesian, wholly justified theoretically and foundationally, uh, can improve forecast accuracy. So that's an introduction. There are uh, a whole series of uh, uh, papers and several groups uh, that have published over the last several years on BPS uh, in various, with, with various formalisms. This is one set of examples. Okay, but what about the decision goals? And my first slide was uh, portfolios, macroeconomics, decision contexts that drive the interest in forecasting to begin. So let's pick one of them. So now Y is a vector of asset returns, and the example will be daily forecasting or five-day-ahead five forecasting for portfolios revised every day. Uh, the models produce their forecasts of, of tomorrow's returns, and the decision here is to choose a portfolio vector of the same dimension of, of Y now, reorganize the portfolio, and see what it turns out to be when we see the data. So the return, if we use model J to optimize the decision vector, the portfolio vector D, uh, this would be our return, linear combination of the re some of the returns. And so here the same sort of philosophy and thinking um, arises for me. Uh, uh, the BPS AVS said, hey, look, we want to forecast the path of the economy, or we want to forecast... 24 months ahead. So let's figure out theoretically how we can do that properly by weighting models differentially. Well, now we kind of like to forecast, you know, the, the euro US dollar exchange rate tomorrow or, or the day after or the day after, the S&P, the price of oil, we'd like accurate forecasts. But it's a portfolio setting. We want to make money. We're betting on the markets. We want to expect a return, we want to control risk. That's the decision forecast that drives the interest in the models in the first place. So this is where we put a D in BPS. We make it BPDS, Bayesian Predictive Decision Synthesis, because we're explicitly reflecting the decision. And that's the same formula. Nothing has changed there. Uh, but it's the notation that hides the flexibility. In both pi t, j, and the alpha t, j, they can now depend on any aspect of model j, including the optimal decision that model j recommends. So each model has its predictive distribution, its forecast, utility function that could be model specific, and it usually has to be in practical portfolio analyses. Decision analysis operates, define an optimal decision, maximize expected utility. So that will be a different decision for each model utility combination. And they can come into play as elements of these two terms, the pies which reflect accumulated performance historically, and the alphas which account for uh, uh, expertise and biases in the outcome space, okay? So the particular form of the alpha function that I'm going to take looks like the example that I used in the, the AVS version, just to reweight historical forecast performance only. But now it's more general. And I'll say, I, I won't have time to go into the technical details today, and it, 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 it's inappropriate to go too deeply into the technical details with such a diverse audience, uh, that this has a foundational theoretical basis. This didn't just come out of thin air, okay? So again, I've got a score function. It's now a vector, S. Each time T is understood, each model is scored on a vector of utilities, okay? 
They could be return and some measure of risk or, or negative risk. It could be several components. And that explicitly depends on the outcome we're forecasting and the optimal decision made or recommended by Model J. And there's a linear combination here, a tor vector that relatively weights them. I'll say a few more words about that in the example of portfolios. This is opening up an opportunity to bring multi-criteria decision analysis into model weighting in decision-focused forecasting. It couples nicely with the AVS style. Uh, this is the same as we did with the AVS example, where the, the historical information in weighting is communicated through these probabilities, I'll call them initial probabilities at time t, which are disc slightly discounted, exponentially discounting historical performance. And then actually what we scored last time when we, see, when we saw last month's or last, uh, yesterday's data. Okay. So historical information accumulates through the pies, scoring forecast accuracy and the, the role of the decision uh, of each model. And then this term looks ahead and says, hey, you know, next month uh, we'd, uh, we want to reweight models because we think this model does better prediction over here, this model does better prediction over here in Y space. But we also want to bet on better models with respect to the decision. We'd like to have models that we expect to improve returns and control risk. So let's jump in with the, uh, the, the example. Uh, this is a, an old example, um, but it's still a good example. A collection of currencies relative to the US dollar, the prices of, of several currencies, um, a couple of commodities, gold and oil, and a couple of US market indices, the NASDAQ and, and S&P. And these are just the returns on the, on the raw series and the, uh, the models here are time-varying vector order regressions, just as the first example. I like to use log prices, so we'll log the, the, the actual prices of the series, uh, model the log prices, and then convert to returns for the portfolio analysis. And on the log price scale, we've got uh, 10 or 11 series here. They're modeled by time-varying vector order regressions, uh, it's daily data. If you, if, you, if you know daily data like this, you know there are momentum effects. If you don't, you don't know. There are momentum effects, okay? One, two, three-day momentum. So there's uncertainty about the lag of the autoregressions in there. I haven't got that in this example. Uh, that defines, you know, each, each choice of lags defines uh, a model. The models here uh, vary in two respects. Uh, the degree of adaptivity over time, we use discount factors to, to infuse time variation. High discount factors are stable models, low discount factors adapt more. That's a choice, discount factors. And in the decision space, we've got a choice too. We build Markowitz portfolios where we have a target return, 25% a year on a daily basis, say, and we'd like to optimize portfolios with respect to a target expectation, minimize variance, okay? mean variance optimization. So the analysis I'm, I'm summarizing here is just daily updates with one day ahead. I'll just give you the one day ahead uh, example and five day ahead rebalancing. So for the BPS, uh, BPDS, where, does this, where do we get the score? Well, we dream it up. It's a, a vector of utilities. And this example, it's very natural at least to start with a Markowitz style utility. So this is the return on Model J when it's realized. This is some target, 25% annually reduced to a daily basis, say. Uh, this is the actual return. So this two-dimensional utility function, if we want this high, we get a high return. We get a low, the expectation of the second term is negative variance. So these are utilities that uh, complement each other, and it's a nice duel with the, the usual Marko, uh, Markowitz uh, portfolio optimization. So you'll recall that in the BPDS formula, in the exponential of the alpha function, there's a tor vector that, that has, in this case, two elements that weight these two utilities. So we're differentially weighting the utilities. That comes out of the analysis, 
Uh, there's a unique tour that's, that's defined in a principled way. I'll mention that later. Um, and in this setting, those of you that, that, that come from the, this area or, or know this area, financial mathematics generally, uh, the, the tor one and tor two, uh, the ratio is basically a risk aversion parameter um, in, in weighting the second term versus the first. You can see how the, you could add dimension, you could add a, a, other terms into the score vector or use different, different elements. You could have indicator functions, the indicator of the return being bigger than 1%. Okay, you'd like that, or the indicator that's bigger than 2%, okay? But you have to balance with, with, uh, with risk so that you don't go overboard on models that are wildly optimistic. Okay, um, so the title is important here. This is, again, a, a, a proof of concept. Um, what we have there is a collection of models. Each of those curves comes from one model uh, several of them, then from BMA, Bayesian Model Averaging, Standard Analysis, and then from BPDS. So I've indexed on the, on the graph the, end of the, the official end of the, the great financial crisis and the start of the Eurozone debt crisis. Um, and let's just run through the models here. They are ordered down, top down, in terms of Sharpe ratio, empirical return divided by empirical risk, effectively. Um, averaged over the uh, time period. So BPDS wins. Uh, it has a sharp ratio about 35% higher than BMA. It's quite an improvement. Okay. Second to BPDS is a model with two parameters. It has, you know, 1.12 um, sharp ratio. Beta is a discount factor. Beta of 0.98 here is a relatively stable model. A beta of 0.94 is more adaptation over time. Multivariate volatility is, is really controlled by that parameter. And the second parameter, R, is, I called it M in the previous slide, is, is target return on a daily basis. So the, second, the, the, highest, the highest scoring model in terms of sharp ratio is this particular time varying vector order regression with a fairly aggressive daily return. But BPDS dominates uh, fairly substantially, and you can see BMA down here, um, which, which, again, I'm regarding as the, as the, as the you know, it's the standard. It's what, what we've been doing for 50 years. Um, doesn't, it doesn't do anything other than score one step ahead forecasts. So it's, it's trying hard to weight models. It's weighting models more based on forecasting this set of equities one day ahead, okay? Well, BPDS has an edge. Well, it has an edge because it wants to emphasize the decision outcomes as well. And, and why? Uh, I mean, let's investigate a bit. So this is a picture of each day as we're updating the model, okay, optimizing within each model, choosing a portfolio, then doing the same for, for, for BMA and BPDS. Uh, these are the optimal portfolio weights for BMA versus BPDS. Uh, and this, to make it a bit clearer, is the difference BPDS minus BMA. Let me just highlight a couple. Since we're in France, let's go to the euro. Okay, that's the orange curve. So you'll see that the orange curve is hidden in the mess until the beginning of the great financial crisis. I'm, I'm, yeah, that's right. Uh, and then BPDS uh, likes the euro uh, until about 20, until we get into, really into the depth of the crisis. And then it begins to short the euro, okay? Positive means buy, negative means sell. BMA does it, but when you look at the difference, you'll see that in the eurozone crisis, BPDS said get out of the euro more than BMA, okay? And it's doing that relative to BMA because it's adapting to the decision outcomes. The other one is the Swiss franc. Um, you know, they're both, both in the Swiss franc later on, but the difference uh, in the run-up to the Eurozone crisis was that uh, um, BPDS was longer on the, on the Swiss franc. So there's some differences, small differences there that are coming in in relative weightings that just show you how adding 
the, the goal focus, the decision focus, can help. This is one day ahead. The differences are much bigger on, when we're forecasting five days ahead. Um, um, but that, that wasn't in the paper. Um, it's in a follow-on paper. Let me see, 25 minutes. Uh, okay. So who likes, uh, who likes to see a bit of the technical stuff? Let's have just, just one slide on the, on the technical stuff. And then I'll come back to the final example. So there's the formula, okay? We start off with an initial set of predictive densities and an initial set of probabilities based on historical uh, performance. And then we insert this term. We choose a vector of utilities. That's a choice. And uh, they are weighted relatively by a vector of, of, of elements in this tor. And I will point out, it's on the slide later, but let me say it now, if tor is zero, if tor is zero, that term disappears, it's, it's, it's one, and we get the pi-weighted models. So let's assume that we built the pies as a Bayesian does, based on historical data uh, in BMA. So that's a special case. BMA is a special case. And I'll call that special case the initial mixture, you know, the, the sum of, of, of pi's times the densities, ignoring the, the zero because BMA doesn't have zero. Okay? The foundation underlying this form, formula, first of all, BPS is, is, is a subjective Bayesian uh, foundation. Uh, but then the way this formula arises is, is by bringing decision analysis to the table. And the particular approach is called, we call it relaxed entropic tilting. Uh, entropic tilting's been around for about 15 years uh, in, in, a, in different kinds of applications. Uh, and I I'll, I'll, um, uh, can refer to that later. And it also intersects for the Bayesians in the audience uh, some recent developments in what's called either robust or generalized Bayes. Um, that's a bit of an aside, but in case there are people that know about that, I know about it too, although I don't do it. Um, so there's a foundation. And I'll point out that when you look at this formula, it's a density function, P. It's normalized. There it's proportional. Uh, you can reorganize it by taking this exponential term and HTJ of Y and normalizing that, and I'll call that FTJ, so we've multiplied the H by an exponential term, and the terminology is tilting. It's exponential tilting or entropic tilting. It's a modification of H to deal with biases, regions of expertise, and so forth. And because this has to be a density, this has to have a constant of normalization, which gets combined with the pi's to give modified pies. Okay, I'll call them pi tilde, and I'll refer to these as the BPDS weights. And this modification, this sort of calibrates the densities, deals with biases uh, in the main. It also depends on the decisions. But these weights then, the pi tildes reward good decisions, because the decisions are sitting inside them. So the initial mixture, the BMA mixture, has tor equals zero, and that gets morphed through this entropic tilting idea um, into modified densities that are averaged with modified weights. Okay, again, well, BMA arises in this case. I've got much more to say on this. Uh, let me give you the example. Well, let me see, I've got 20 minutes. Let me go there now. If I can. Well, that's not it. Let me see. Um, seems like the... All right, I, I, I can't see where I'm going here, so let me go back to where I was. Uh, Close it. And, uh, I hit the slide at the end, so uh, I, I won't tab through. I'll, le I'll leave it there and come back to that at the end.
Okay. Other context, other context with decision goals. Well, Christine's up there, so this is this is monetary policy example. But it, as I mentioned earlier, it's bigger than that. Okay. So in the monetary policy context, the example we'll have is D will be central bank interest rates. The data is U.S. data. It's the federal funds uh, target rate. Could be other things, other policy levers, as they say, controls on money supply and things like that. And the outcomes will be things like the path of inflation over the next two years, the path of unemployment, the joint path of unemployment and inflation. The targets for the decisions are to move the economy into a nice place. Reasonable growth, reasonably low unemployment, uh, reasonably low inflation. But there are much broader purview, uh, the much broader purview is, is any design problem, any control problem where your act, based on optimizing your decision, influences the outcome. Portfolio is not like that. The portfolio example, you don't, unless you are you know, one of the uh, major hedge funds, if you're Citadel, you can influence the outcomes. But most of us uh, minor investors, and most, most investors, uh, haven't, are not in that position. So there the outcome is, is not influenced by the decision. And that's a big change in, 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 in thinking about the methodology. So explicitly then, uh, I'm making it clear in the notation, that when a model is used in this kind of context, we first make the decision, Bayesian decision analysis, okay? And then on the optimal decision, make a forecast. Scenario forecasting, what if forecasting? Um, each model will have a utility function that may or may not depend on the model. In the example we have here, we use the same utility function across each model. And again here, we want to bet on better models. It's good that models do a good job. If this model does a better job of forecasting inflation than this one, that's good. I mean, most of you know that most models, most macroeconomic forecasting econometric models, you know, are not very good certainly in the last couple of decades. We need better models for forecasting. But the other part of this today is that if you use this model or this model or this model to produce a recommended optimal decision about setting uh, interest rates, for example, over the next few months, okay, then the outcome of the economy following that decision is a score for that model. So we want to bet on better models in that sense, as well as pure forecasting accuracy. Now, on the technical side, life gets complicated. I'm not going to talk at all about computation. You know, I've got 50 or 80 uh, additional slides with lots of things on that. Um, but it's a context where, unlike the portfolio example, in the portfolio example, the, the models just forecast, and there's a tour implied. Uh, now we're in a, a, question, a, a, a case where the models forecast conditional on a decision for that model. So the tour depends um, on, the, on the decision. So the example is in monetary policy here, two good friends. Uh, some of you know some of them. Um, I have to say this for Tony. He's not here, so he can't say it. Um, and uh, the example is explicitly what I, what I, just, uh, what I just described at a high level. We take uh, a measure of inflation as the primary target. Okay, everybody knows it's got to get to 2%. I, I don't know. I personally don't know why it's always been 2%. Um, but it's got to get to 2%. Okay? We want other things to happen as well. Again, I, I use the term, uh, let's try and move the economy to, to a good place, a good regime. Um, now, when the when the Federal Reserve Board uh, makes a statement about its target interest rates, um, 
it, it's, it's rare enough that they move it by more than a, a quarter of a percent, let alone 1% or 2% or 3%. They don't want to rock the boat. I don't think um, Chairman Jerome Powell has ever said it that way, but that's the point. A, a big shift in the, in the interest rate, the decision variable, as it's been for the last few weeks or few months, is, is going to be regarded as a negative, whether it goes up or down, um, by the markets uh, in particular. So the decision framework has, has, has sort of general considerations that ought to be reflected in utility functions. So what we have here is uh, two models, so very straightforward as an example. And these are, quote, standard models um, in, in, this, uh, in this area. Again, they're vector autoregressions. There's no time variation in these now. Their parameters are constant. So you fit over the last few years, and then every quarter you update, and uh, there's no time varying parameters. Um, it's as simple as it gets. And the first model has um, a measure of inflation, PCE, personal co uh, consumption expenditure, shadow federal rate, a measure of the, um, the interest rate. It's a shadow rate. It's allowed to go negative. Uh, and GDP. It's quarterly data. The second model is an elaboration of that model. It's a little more complicated. It has some financial variables in there. So it's bringing the, the financial sector into it um, in a couple of ways. So it's a... Uh, statistically, it's, it's a bigger model, so it'll be more adaptive. When things change a lot, it'll be more adaptive because it's got more parameters. Okay, and that can be good, that can be bad. Okay, it can be bad for the decisions. Uh, if you get a radical change, uh, um, then it's potentially going to lead to a, a rather radical change in the optimal decision implied. And I haven't spoken about the baseline. BPDS has this zero model. And here we take this simply as the initial mixture, the BMA mixture at each quarter, but we make it flatter, we make the density flatter in all dimensions to allow for data that is a little bit extreme under either model one or model two. And so that will be picked up when neither of those models is really good enough. Okay? And by the way, uh, and, and that will be a signal to hey, step back and say, well, maybe we should change the models okay, or do something else. Uh, so the setting now, specific goals, you weight models with respect to specific goals. Okay? It's a very different concept than you know, traditional statistical economic thinking. We build a model and we forecast everything with it. Whoops. Okay. But here, it would trying to invert that philosophy. So we're forecasting eight quarters ahead, and each quarter we get data, we update, each model then updates its decision analysis and gives the optimal interest rate path over the next eight quarters. BMA averages the models based on the initial mixture, and it uses decision analysis to update the BMA optimal decision path over the next eight quarters, and BPDS takes that initial mixture, maps it with the entropic tilting to get BPDS weights that combine the calibrated densities and apply decision analysis to that. And in each model and for the decisions, we use a, a, a discounted uh, utility and we just average across the quarters um, to, to do that. But in the BPDS analysis, we need to choose this score, you know, the exponential of Tor transpose score. And here we're interested in eight quarters ahead and the path of the economy over those eight quarters. Okay. We'd like to have inflation, as measured by PCE, eight quarters ahead from now, close to a specified target for that quarter. Okay, so I don't know what it is now. So US inflation, PCE now, 3.6%, something like that. So over the next eight quarters, well, next quarter we'd like it to be down to 3.2, maybe down to 2.8. In four quarters, we'd like it to be at 2%. So that's a specified, a desired path over the next uh, two years. And this is a positive number. We're going to penalize deviations from that path. But we don't want to rock the boat. So our decision variable 
which is the uh, federal funds rate, um, is D. And this says, we don't want big changes quarter to quarter. We'll penalize big changes quarter to quarter. Uh, there are two constants in there. You can argue about whether you want to weight this term more heavily th than that. There, there are choices to be made. You can stick one of them to be one, and, and, and you just have to choose the ratio. The other point is this is a bounded score. You know, it's natural. A lot of people in econometrics in particular, they like to use quadratics. Quadratic score, okay? Traditional in statistics, but it's unbounded. Uh, in the BPDS, there's an exponential of the score, so if the score is bounded, then that always delivers the density. It's always integrable. That's one technical point. Uh, but also, um, utility functions should generally be bounded. Okay. Personal utilities for money are bounded. Right? If you lose a billion dollars tomorrow, it doesn't matter if you lose another billion, unless you're Elon Musk. Okay. So. Uh, there are a couple of reasons that we like, I like uh, uh, bounded scores. Okay, and as I said, there's an underlying utility function that, uh, that drives the decision analysis in each model and in BPS and BMA. So here's uh, one of uh, two slides uh, uh, from, the, from, the, from the example. And this is a plot that um, people in banks like to look at. It's called a spaghetti plot. Uh, this is the, the time period up until the end of 2022. Uh, the black line in here is the actual federal fund shadow rate. So it's a smooth curve in that plot. The blue lines at each quarter were, well, let's take this nasty one. At this quarter, whatever it was in 2006, this is the next eight quarters. This is the optimal Fed funds policy rate over the next eight quarters if the decision were to be made this quarter. So at this point, the, the shadow rate exacerbates the implication for the actual rate, which can't go negative. Uh, so that would say drop the actual rate to, to zero. Okay. BPDS is red, BMA is blue. So a couple of points. All this is showing is a what-if analysis. You know, there's one outcome here, what the Federal Reserve actually did. And now we're simply looking back and saying, well, if we did traditional statistics, we'd be using BMA. How does that compare with what happened? If we're using what I hope becomes traditional statistics, if we're using BPDS instead, weighing the outcome in the decision space as well as pure forecast accuracy, um, how, how would that differ? Um, and remember that BMA is local. It's based on only one quarter forecast accuracy. Okay, and it just doesn't allow for the uh, relative weightings of the models based on uh, outcomes of decisions. So here, um, some of you might be old enough to remember the dot-com bubble um, 23 or four years ago. Uh, I'm just going to point out three, three points where BMA and BPDS seem to differ quite a bit. And that's just showing... How, be, how the decision angle uh, changes basic statistical thinking. So here, in the run-up to the dot-com bubble and the, the collapse of the stock market, um, BPDS was, was saying, um, hey, let's tighten up. Let's increase the cost of money. Let's increase interest rates. Okay, it was anticipating a need to make, to, to squeeze the economy a little bit. We had this explosion of investment in, in, in um, IT companies. And it, the markets were overheated and companies were overvalued. And then it collapsed. Uh, BMA was pretty much consistent with what the Federal Reserve Board actually did. Okay? It, it didn't see that coming so aggressively. Second point is following uh, f later on in the 2000s, a very, very stable economy, uh, very nice unemployment, very nice inflation for several years. Oh, for those days. Um, BMA was, was continually over those two or three years saying, we need to increase, we need to tighten the economy. Uh, BPDS was saying, hey, it's pretty good, let's stay stable, don't change anything. We're in a good place. And the third period is related to the, uh, just after the great financial crisis, um, 
where BPDS says, let's relax, right? Let's, let's, let's push down, okay? Let's, uh, you know, let's, let's drop interest rates. And, and again, BMA was, was pushing hard to, to squeeze the economy. In general, uh, you know, in, in other periods, they're very, very similar. In general, the BPDS tends to be closer to what actually happened uh, most of the time, except at a couple of, quote, crisis periods. Okay, so BPDS takes the initial mixture, the historically uh, based probabilities pi, and averages the forecast densities with them. That's the initial mixture. Uh, it takes that and modifies the densities for biases and so forth, and modifies the weights to reflect uh, historical forecast performance and the decision outcomes. So you can look at these weights. And this is BP, BMA weights over time. And the blue is model one and, and red is model two. So if you see a lot of blue, that means the probability pi on model one is higher than model two. And what happens with BMA is you're going through here. This is the financial crisis. It likes the simpler model until the financial crisis. And then it switches over to the more complicated model, almost all of the probability. And you may or may not know that it's probability theory, it's easy to show, everybody should know it, that if you use BMA, eventually one of the models will win. At some point it will become persistently red. There's a bit of blue coming here, but later on you keep running the model. One of the models gets all the probability eventually. Uh, there's more variability in the BPDS analysis. BPDS is more adaptive, it's more continually adaptive. The decisions are shaking up the probabilities, the pi tildes, uh, as you go through time in a way that BMA cannot. And um, so there's several things we could say there I'm, I'm, uh, at, at the end of time here. But it has this um, ability to weight models differentially based on unsupported or supported decisions. And uh, when you look inside the, some, of the, some of the results here, as we do in the paper, uh, it's just he more heavily responsive to what's happening in the financial markets. Uh, this is kind of interesting at the end here. It, it bumps up and it really says, hey, beginning of 2020, I don't like this more complicated red model. Don't know what's happening in the financial markets. It's going crazy. I'm going to get out of that model. I'm going to go back to the, uh, to the blue model, the simpler economic model. And that's part of, partly induced by the fact that we've got a smoothing effect when we're looking at eight, eight months. You know, we, we, we want more stability, uh, and that's being encouraged. Okay, um, small detail, the baseline model doesn't really matter in this example. It matters more in other examples, um, but it does give you a signal, it can give you a signal of, of something interesting is starting to happen. Okay, um, so I'm pretty much on time. I don't want to overrun. Let me give you a couple of uh, slides to finish up. This is uh, Emily, um, who recently defended a PhD. We had a paper last year in the RSSB on all of the background theory, the foundation, and um, some examples, some portfolio examples in particular. Um, a recent archive paper with a, a, a very detailed portfolio case study on, on, on bigger and much more recent data that might interest some of you. Um, Gary and Tony and Emily um, um, have uh, got this paper with me that is also an archive, which brings the few slides of my example um, to, to real life, um, and that's currently uh, under review at a journal. You can find any of these, of course, you know where to find them. Okay, um, I have one minute and 15 seconds by my clock. So, no more technicalities. Anybody that wants to ask me a question about the technicality or anything else, I'll be around, of course. I just want to stress this, uh, particularly for those of you that forgot about it uh, or never saw it, and particularly for those of you that are responsible for uh, curricula in, in university teaching in whatever discipline. Okay, I've talked a lot about models. An old friend of mine coined the term belief analysis about 30 years ago uh, to refer to Bayesian analysis. We use probabilities to manipulate information, to characterize information. 
um, and, and use it um, in forecasting. And so that's the whole business of modeling, inference, and prediction, okay? And that's what we teach when we teach statistics and economics and econometrics. And what's often not so prominent and not taught, um, and certainly in statistics, uh, woefully underrepresented, uh, is, is the yang to, to the yin that belief analysis is, that we do it for a purpose. We don't just build models, forecasting models to forecast. Most, well, most of the time we don't, excuse me. Okay. Um, and in a sense, BPS, Bayesian Predictive Synthesis, was, is, is all about improving the belief analysis. And now coupled with the D, the BPDS, makes it holistic yin and yang. Thank you for your attention. And again, I'm happy to take questions.